Hello, I'm Savannah and welcome to Science is Everywhere. Today I am joined by Jonathan. Jonathan, would you like to say hello and introduce the topic that you've brought for us to discuss today? Hi Savannah, of course. Uh, but first, before I introduce the topic, I have a question for you. Do you like baked goods like cakes, cookies and things like that? Yeah, of course I do. What do you normally like to eat? Well, typically, um, I like to bake cookies um, and especially baklava. I think that baklava is my favorite thing to bake. Awesome. Well, I'm always intrigued about the chemistry of cooking and I love baked goods. In fact, I have here a few samples. These are my favorite Colombian Almohavanas. I not only love eating these baked goods, but I also always ask myself about like what's the chemistry involved um do you bake often yes i do like to bake pretty often what do you normally bake um normally when i'm baking i really like to make banana nut bread i like to make baklava um one thing i don't know if you would consider this too much baking but i love making my grandma's flan okay yeah well Myself, I recently decided to try baking a couple of things. I don't really do it a lot, but I wanted to try it out and learn. And I try to make chocolate chip cake and also pretzels. However, I realized that I made a few mistakes in the process. And those mistakes actually made me look into the chemistry behind them. Oh, so what happened? So it turns out that I baked a cake batter that I prepared using sodium bicarbonate. So in the batter, I added like a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate instead of baking powder. And at the end, when I took it out of the oven, it came out tasting like soap. Oh my gosh. It didn't taste good at all. It tastes like a chemical. And like I said, it, it had a soapy taste to it. Oh my gosh, that is not good. But so hold on. Uh, sodium bicarbonate is in baking powder. So it should have worked too, no? Or I mean, what do you think happened there? So what I think it happened, and to better understand from a chemistry perspective, I want to show you a quick experiment. So this is courtesy of our fellow staff scientists, Julian and Elizabeth, who filmed these videos for us. And here we have baking soda and baking powder, uh, the same amount of each approximately. Uh, we have two empty beakers and two smaller beakers containing vinegar, approximately 20 milliliters of vinegar in each beaker. Now the baking powder is transferred to one of the empty beakers and then the baking soda is transferred into the other empty beaker. And now what What's happening is that vinegar is being added to each one of these powders. And as we can see, when you add vinegar to both baking soda and baking powder, there is a lot of bubbling happening, right? So these bubbles are carbon dioxide. This is an acid-based reaction that forms carbon dioxide and water. This is an important reaction in the context of baking because both baking soda and baking powder can be used as ingredients because those CO2 bubbles, those carbon dioxide bubbles, will make the air pockets in batter larger. So that will result in a spongy, fluffy cake. Okay, so that makes some, a lot of sense to me, Jonathan. Um, but why adding vinegar? Because cake recipes don't really call for, ginner, for vinegar as far as I know. That's a good question. So in this experiment, we used vinegar to model or to mimic how acids in the batter would react with the bicarbonate in baking powder or baking soda. And the reason to want to mimic that is that common batter ingredients include chocolate, citric fruits, and wine, all of which contain acidic substances. Hmm, that is true. Now, I want to contrast what we just saw with this second experiment that I'm going to show you. Again, we have baking soda and baking powder samples, the same amount of each approximately. We have two empty beakers and two smaller beakers, both containing distilled water. The baking powder goes into one of the empty beakers. And the baking soda goes into the other beaker. And now distilled water is poured or added to each one of these powders. Now notice that carbon dioxide bubbles form only 
when water is added to the baking powder sample. There are no bubbles at all in the beaker containing baking soda and water. Hmm. So can you explain why that is? Yeah, so what's happening is that if we look at the ingredients of baking powder, we can see that it contains an acidic ingredient. In the particular case of this baking powder that we use for this video, the acidic ingredient is acid calcium phosphate, also known as calcium dihydrogen phosphate. This acid will react with the bicarbonate in baking powder, producing carbon dioxide, water, and salts. This acid will make sure that the carbon dioxide is formed so that it works as a leavening agent in the baking process. Like I told you before, the CO2 will bind to those air pockets in the batter, making the bubbles larger, which will give us a result fluffy, spongy cakes. Mm, okay, so I see. So the mixture of an acid and the bicarbonate in baking powder, plus the moisture that's in the batter, that is what releases the carbon dioxide needed for making the batter lighter and fluffier. Okay, so I also think that this is why it's sometimes called ready-made baking powder. So now, can't heat turn bicarbonate into carbon dioxide as well? Yes, that is true. However, the decomposition of bicarbonate by heat will result in sodium carbonate. Besides the carbon dioxide that is generated and the water, uh, and sodium carbonate will affect the pH of the batter. The result will be a soapy tasting cake, which is what happened to me. That's the mistake I made. Recall that sodium carbonate is a base, and it can turn also some fats present in the batter into soap molecules. Mm, wow. Okay, so really simple chemistry can have a lot of impact in the foods that we eat, for sure. Jonathan, that's a really good example of the role of acids in baking. So do you have an example of the role of a base or an alkali in baking too? Yes. Uh, in fact, an example of the importance of bases in baking is the art of making pretzels. Ah, interesting. I love German pretzels. In fact, I was born in Germany, so I feel like I really have a connection to those. I love pretzels myself. Um, and it turns out that original German recipes for making pretzels call for something called lye. And lye is a concentrated solution in water of sodium hydroxide. And we know that sodium hydroxide is a strong base, right? And what they do is they take this lye solution and they dip or immerse the pretzel dough in it before putting the pretzels in the oven. Mm. Well, so first, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So why would you have that in the kitchen? Yeah, I mean, most people won't have sodium hydroxide or lye in their kitchen. This is typically what they use in a bakery, right? But if you do have it in your kitchen, the reason to use sodium hydroxide or lye when making pretzels is that this base is required to accelerate a very important reaction uh, called the Maillard reaction, which is what causes the browning and the very unique taste of pretzels. So the Maillard reaction occurs between sugar and amino acid molecules that are present in the dough. And what this reaction generates is a range of different compounds uh, that give the color and the flavor to many foods, including pretzels. And this type of reaction needs heat and it's optimal at temperatures between 140 and 165 degrees Celsius, are equivalent to between 280 and 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. So, and how is an alkali or base important in this type of reaction? That's a really good question. So it's been shown by scientists that have looked into this reaction very carefully that strong bases like sodium hydroxide that is present in lye or even milder bases like sodium bicarbonate will facilitate this reaction. So what happens is that they will, the base will provide the pH conditions that are favorable for the reaction between the sugars and the amino acids to take place. And to illustrate that, I have a short video that I recorded myself in my kitchen uh, to illustrate the importance of bases in the Miller reaction.
Here's what I did. I prepared the pretzel dough using typical ingredients, white flour, yeast, milk. And um, after allowing the yeast to work on the dough, I cut this dough into four pieces. Then what I did is I soaked two of the pieces in a hot solution of sodium bicarbonate. What that means is I took a couple tablespoons of sodium bicarbonate and added that to boiling water. And like I said, I only immersed two pieces of the dough in the sodium bicarbonate solution and left the other two untreated. Then before putting them in the oven, I applied a layer of milk to all four pieces of dough. And then I baked all four of them for about 15 minutes. Okay, so I see you ran a controlled experiment here. Exactly, and the results show that treating the dough with the basic solution, with the sodium bicarbonate solution, indeed resulted in a nice browning of the small pretzel buns. That's something that you can easily tell by looking at this image. The ones that did not get treated with the sodium bicarbonate solution remain of a lighter color. You don't really see significant browning of those pretzel buns. Mm. So it is nice to see that you got good results even without having to use the stronger sodium hydroxide. Yes, that is true. Now keep in mind that upon heating, some sodium bicarbonate would have converted into sodium carbonate on the surface of the dough as it was being baked in the oven. So because of that conversion into sodium carbonate, we are achieving a higher pH, right? Sodium carbonate is the stronger base than sodium bicarbonate. And that most likely helped with the Maillard reaction that was taking place on the surface of the pretzel dough. Oh, that is pretty cool. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Those are two really cool examples of the ways we use acid-base chemistry in the kitchen. And I wanna go ahead and say again, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to all of our viewers for watching our series here, Science Everywhere. Make sure that you keep an eye out for more ways that science is everywhere.